Let's bring in our CNN contributor, the former Nixon White House counsel, John Dean. Uh, John, great to see you on this unprecedented day. Help with context. As someone who understands Watergate, the stain that was on America, now you have a mugshot, the first ever in history of a former president of the United States, the fourth time a former president of the United States has been processed in a criminal case uh, in recent months. Put it in context. It's, it, it, your word unprecedented is correct. Uh, we're, we've moved into an area this country's never been. Uh, I can think of no, obviously there's no president, no, not even collectively presidents that amount to what is being charged here in these four different cases. Uh, I can't think of a public figure or public figures that add up to what's going on here. So we've really moved into what is the area of organized crime and the mob. And yet it's coming right out of activities that occurred in the White House and threaten our democracy. So uh, this is this is a chapter. Uh, we don't know how it's going to end, but I certainly hope it ends with uh, the facts being uh, carrying the, the sanctions they should. And how important is that, again, in the context of Watergate, uh, the stain it was on the country, but also the crisis of confidence in political leadership it caused in Washington, uh, the rebooting of the Republican Party back in those days. I'm not making any direct comparison uh, because the significance is the scope of it is so much bigger right now. But you have the former president of the United States. He has an inmate number and a mugshot tonight. Uh, your colleague, Mr. Haldeman, I believe, did have a mugshot. Mark Meadows, who would be his counterpart, the chief of staff to Donald Trump, has a mugshot. Rudy Giuliani, the president's lead attorney, uh, in fighting, fighting, and fighting long after the last whistle had blown, uh, fighting for fraud. Uh, what do you see as the damage to political institutions done by all of this? Well, in Watergate, the initial reaction was terribly negative public reaction as well as political reaction. The, the Republicans paid dearly for it. The Congress got its act together and became a co-equal to the executive branch. Uh, and was actually doing legitimate oversight and uh, directing more policy than they had in decades. But we also entered very quickly, John, an era of scandal. Uh, Jimmy Carter, for example, one of the most moral men who's ever been in the Oval Office, was plagued with scandals. There was an independent counsel law that was created, and it, uh, it went after people for things that really were way beyond the call and need. So that there was that negative that uh, followed in just this era of scandal. But it, it does affect the way Washington works. And I, the problem is I don't see that remedy on the horizon here yet. We've got the disintegration of a Republican Party uh, that is just amazing to me. Donald Trump somehow has proved himself a catalyst to bring out the worst of the party. And the tail is now wagging the dog. And, and so what is the solution to that? If you go back to the Nixon days, you know, some of the, the gray hairs in the Republican Party finally came to the president and said, sir, you must go. You have to go for the good of the country and the good of the party. Here, Nixon was disgraced. Donald Trump presents himself as a victim and a martyr. True. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful myth that I'll explain to you someday <laughs> when over lunch. It's, it's, it's a long conversation to straighten out the gray hairs. Uh, they did do something of that nature, but not quite as history has it. Uh, the, the remedy here has got to be understanding that Trump has triggered uh, it's OK for the darkest personalities on the political horizon to take charge. Uh, authoritarian personalities have long existed in the Republican and conservative ranks. Before, they were sort of hiding under rocks or embarrassed to come out and be who they thought they should be. I think they've got to get back under rocks, and the only people who can do that is the rest of the electorate. They far outnumber uh, the authoritarian personalities that are now running the show, and that's what's got to happen in an election, the next election, the next election, and the next election. Uh, you don't see that uh, refitting, if you will, or rebooting, at least in the f in front of you right now. Perhaps it will happen in the weeks and months of the campaign no. ahead. John Dean, grateful for your perspective tonight. Let's continue the conversation with my great panel here tonight, the former senior investigative counsel for the January 6th committee, Temadayo Aganja-Williams, our CNN legal analyst, Karen Friedman Agnifilo, CNN political senior political commentators, David Axelrod and Scott Jennings. David, I want to start with you to follow up on John's point. You're yeah. a Democrat. You helped Barack Obama get elected, but you're also a former reporter and student of politics and history with your White House experience. 
I asked him the context to you, seeing the former president of the United States, who happens to be on this day the faraway front runner for his party in the next presidential election in a mugshot, and he says he's trying to raise money off this. He's trying to boost his political standing off this instead of showing any remorse. Yeah, look, I, I think the bigger concern that I have is not about Donald Trump, but about the impact that he's had on the country. Uh, the fact that, uh, yes, you know, large numbers of Republican office holders have echoed the narrative, his narrative, that the system is corrupt and rigged, that, that has been weaponized uh, against him. His political project requires him to destroy public faith in our institutions. And he's been pretty successful, at least among his own party. And that, to me, is the long-term legacy of all of this. Everything's disturbing. I, John, every day that I walked into that White House, I felt a sense of awe. I think Scott probably felt the same way. Uh, you know, just to understand what that building represented and the history that took place in that building. Uh, and to, to see uh, this spectacle is heartbreaking. But the bigger concern I have is democracies are fragile. They require that we all buy into uh, these uh, institutions and rules and norms uh, and laws. Donald Trump does not. And he's taking, a, uh, you know, a lot of Americans with him, good people who are getting information from him that they believe. And uh, th he's going to turn that mugshot into a rallying cry. And within the Republican Party, uh, to John Dean's point about how do you get back, how do you move past, um, his point is the voters have to do it because most of most elected Republicans won't. Uh, there are there are many who don't like Donald Trump, but they also don't like to talk about Donald Trump, and they would prefer to just hide from all of this. And there are many who are repeating his lies to this day. What happens? Is, will it take Republican voters? And do you see any evidence in front of us now that that's even a remote possibility, given his standing in the polls? All change in America comes from electoral outcomes. And so if uh, he doesn't win another presidential election, I mean, that would, you know, move you uh, a step farther down the road. But what it doesn't necessarily fix is what David is talking about, and that's this utter lack of faith in institutions. You said he doesn't believe in institutions and wants to destroy them. I agree with you, but I think... I'll take it a step further. We were already there. I mean, I think there were a great many Americans, millions of Americans, who had lost almost all faith in institutions, and he sort of picked up on it. And that's what led him to get the nomination in 16 and ultimately allowed him to, at least in the Electoral College, defeat Hillary Clinton. So we're on a several years long slide against institutions. And I'll be honest, I, I don't think the current occupant of the White House has done much to restore a lot of faith in institutions in some ways. I don't know that any Republicans believe that he's lived up to his uh, uh, pronouncements on that front. Somebody after an election is going to have to do it. I don't know who it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to be. But until someone wins an election and lives up to that institutional integrity point, we are going to continue on this slide. And it's very jarring and it's troubling and it's downright scary. Well, let's come back to the legal aspects of this for a few minutes and we'll do more in the hour and the next hour ahead. But there's a collision between legal and politics here. If we could show uh, first on his Truth Social platform and then Donald Trump returned to X, formerly known as Twitter tonight, for the first time uh, since right before he left office. And you see that posted right there. There's the mugshot where he is scowling. He's, his team says he tried to look defiant. You read that as you wish. But, uh, Karen, never surrender are the words right there. What did Donald Trump do today in Atlanta? Well, he yeah. surrendered. He, yeah. uh, he surrendered himself to be arrested and formally charged with the various crimes, the 13 crimes uh, on the 98-page indictment there. So he did surrender. And then, you know, after that, after he was released from custody, he, he made these false statements saying that he... Uh, basically saying he's allowed to challenge an election, which he is allowed to challenge an election, but that's not what he's charged with. He's charged with trying to steal an election. And and I'm, I'm reminded of the, the bank analogy, right, where you, you have charges on your account, you call the bank, you ask them to reverse the charges, they don't. You go to the bank, you ask them to reverse the charges, they don't. 
you can't then go rob the bank to get your money back, to get them to reverse the charges, right? And so that's the difference, is he's trying to make it seem like, oh, all I did was challenge the election. But when you really read the indictment, and that's the beauty of, of charging RICO, is you have this speaking indictment with lots of facts, Donald Trump and others worked together in a concerted effort with many different prongs to try and steal an election. And that indictment is written so that anyone can read it, you don't have to be a lawyer, and you can see the facts for yourself.